Uh, today is the very, I would say, dark uh, anniversary, four-year anniversary of the start, uh, what started as a protest movement and more than turned into an uprising, then into a very long and drawn-out bloody civil war. Uh, four years later, it's a very dark uh, situation from uh, overestimated maybe up about 300,000 killed so far, uh, many more injured, 9 million displaced, 3 million outside of Syria, certainly the worst humanitarian tragedy uh, in this generation, uh, without any real signs that things are winding down or moving forward or moving towards a resolution. Uh, the economy as well uh, devastated, take 30, 40 years of progress to get back to where it was just four years ago. Uh, the impact on the region has also been serious. Uh, Iraq has been broken again uh, by events in Syria. Lebanon and Jordan shaken but still managing. Uh, Turkey impacted but, uh, but, but managing as well. Uh, it's also uh, beyond the human tragedy and the political conflict given rise uh, to the largest terrorist proto-state in modern history, uh, straddling Syria and Iraq, uh, with uh, also threats to the region and threats to the world. Supporters of the opposition in the region and internationally, including the US, have been for these four years in great disarray, I would say, uh, perhaps coming to some agreement about how to fight ISIS, but still no real effective or united strategy uh, to face down the original cause of all of this, uh, a regime that refused to budge or compromise, uh, and still no clear policy forward there. Allies of the regime uh, not only supported the regime, one might even say have taken over the regime. Uh, Iran, in effect, uh, is uh, present itself directly in Iraq and in Syria, uh, and a mood in Tehran among the hardliners of you know, a triumphant that they've done, uh, they've really been able to uh, project power, defend power, let alone their influence in Lebanon, Yemen, and other places. Uh, throughout all of this, US strategy has been unclear, has been hesitant, has been key uh, in, in moving things forward or backwards, but remains uh, uh, not very clear, not very, uh, uh, also not much of a point of consensus with the US's own allies on this issue. We have a really exceptional panel today to discuss these issues, uh, to focus on the way forward. Is there, is there a way forward? How to move uh, towards some kind of resolution of the conflict while at the same time facing down the threat of ISIS. Uh, how should the U.S. rethink uh, its strategy? What is its current set strategy? How can it be rethought or recalibrated to be more effective? Uh, how effective will be the uh, train and equip program, which is supposed to uh, show results uh, later this year? Uh, does the UN initiative focusing on Aleppo freeze and other approaches towards ceasefires, is that is that an effective strategy? Will it succeed and where will it lead? Moscow has been leading some talks uh, recently uh, and some members of this panel were uh, uh, meeting with members of the Russian team and might have some things to say about it. Um, uh, you know, some of the members, maybe all of the members of this very distinguished panel, I'll introduce them briefly in the order in which they will speak. Uh, to my immediate right, Ambassador Robert Ford, who I'm sure is known to all of you. Ambassador Ford was uh, America's last ambassador uh, to Syria, leaving in uh, um, up till 2014, in effect. Uh, before that, he had also served as ambassador to Algeria. He had served as political counselor to the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad from 04 and 06. Uh, so obviously deep experience in Syria, as well as Iraq, hence the Levant in general. Uh, he's currently a senior scholar at the Middle East Institute, and we're obviously thrilled uh, to have him. He's received uh, numerous awards uh, from from the State Department for his distinguished uh, service and his 30-year uh, career before he retired uh, in 2014. Uh, he will be followed by uh, Mr. Muhammad Ala Ghanim to his immediate right. 
Uh, Mr. Ghanem is a senior political advisor and government relations director and strategist for the Syrian American Council in Washington, D.C. Previously, he was a professor at the University of Damascus and was involved from the very, very beginning in the Syrian uprising, the Syrian revolution, and has been certainly deeply involved ever since. He is also a fellow at the Syrian Center for Political and Strategic Studies, where he has been involved in a, uh, a project called the Syria Transition Roadmap, uh, an ambitious post-Assad uh, uh, vision for Syria. He's also a board member uh, of the Coalition for a Democratic Syria. Uh, he will be followed by uh, Daphna Rand. Uh, Daphna is the, currently the Deputy Director of Studies and the inaugural Leon E. Panetta Fellow at the Center for a New American Security. Uh, she served before that on the staff of the National Security Council, where she was responsible for global U.S. assistance efforts in support of democratic transitions, good governance, and rule of law. From 2010 to 2012, she covered the Middle East and North Africa at the policy planning staff, and in that capacity, contributing, contributed to shaping U.S. government response to the Arab Spring as it, as it arose. Uh, previously, she served as a professional staff member on the Senate Select Committee. Uh, her latest book is called Roots of the Arab Spring, Contested Authority and Political Change in the Middle East from the University of Pennsylvania Press, and we're ha very happy to have her with us here. Uh, to her right is Mr. Michael Eisenstadt. Uh, Michael is the Khan Fellow and Director of the Military and Security Studies Program at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He's a specialist in Persian Gulf and Arab-Israeli security affairs. It's published widely on irregular and conventional warfare and nuclear weapons proliferation. Uh, prior to joining the Institute in 1989, Eisenstadt worked as a military analyst with the U.S. government. Uh, he was an officer on uh, an, an, an active duty in many places in the region, um, uh, including uh, Iraq, West Bank, Jordan, Jerusalem, Turkey, uh, and uh, working with the U.S. Central Command. Uh, and we're very happy to have uh, him with us. Uh, they will speak in that order, um, uh, each making a presentation of, of seven or eight minutes. Uh, Robert will start us off uh, with his thoughts on U.S. interests in Syria, U.S. policy, and thoughts about the way forward. Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for that nice introduction. You could have gone on longer, Paul, about the awards, but yeah, well. <laughs> anyway. So, but it's very nice to be here today. Um, thank you all for coming. Wow, it's a big crowd. Um, you all are supposed to know that Iraq is the priority now in the Levant and not Syria, so I don't know why you're all here. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what's our interest in Syria, um, tie that into Iraq. I want to talk a little bit then about what to do uh, to achieve our interests in Syria. Um, first, what's the interest? Well, I think the biggest interest now, obviously, is containing and we hope eventually rolling back the Islamic State. And I emphasize the word eventually uh, because that's not going to be an easy job. The Islamic State is not like Al-Qaeda. It's a much bigger, much more potent organization. It controls territory. It has an administration, not a perfect administration, but it has an administration, collects taxes, operates uh, administrations, um, and, and it is a threat to us, make no mistake. Um, those of you who follow um, what its adherents say, both from inside Syria and Iraq, as well as sympathizers outside, um, if you read their tweets, um, uh, they're pretty blood chilling, and I think we have to take them at their word in terms of their vow to eventually attack us, attack us one day. Um, so the question then, and for me, when I think about Syria, uh, is what to do about this. And I want to share a story about the Islamic State and recruitment of Syrians, recruitment of Syrians into the Islamic State. So I want, I'd ask you bear with me for a minute while I tell a story. Um, of course, Syrians love soccer, call it football, and the goalie of the uh, very popular team in Syria's third largest city, Homs, the goalie is a, was a man named Abdelbasid Sarut. <clears throat> Abdelbasid joined the peaceful protests in Homs in 2011. He was one of the marchers. 
after the regime started to crack down harshly in late 2011 in Homs, um, Abd Abbas had joined groups that were fighting. And eventually, during 2012, became a commander of some of the fighting groups inside Homs. The regime tried to recapture Homs, didn't have enough forces. Remember, it's a minority regime. Army is not so dependable. And so they encircled the areas of Homs, including where Abd Abbas and his fighters were holed up also with their families and lots of civilians. And the regime enforced a siege. Siege meant that for two years, no food, no water, no medicine got in. No one was allowed to leave. That's the other part. Uh, and not surprisingly, over a period of months and then into years, two years, uh, conditions got steadily worse. People starved to death. Women and children starved to death. Uh, people died of, of wounds that should have been treatable. Remember, the regime is dropping bombs, shelling barrel bombs. You know the story. Finally, the United Nations, just about a year ago, worked out a truce whereby the fighters, including Abd Abbas and his people, could leave Homs with their light weapons and go elsewhere. And they took their families out. Abd Abbas had left Homs and promptly joined the Islamic State. Now I want you to remember that the Islamic State has actually killed children for playing soccer. So think about what it would take to get a Syrian prominent soccer player, goalie, to join the Islamic State. I met an activist, um, Mohammed may know him, uh, Salim Kalkabi, whose family knows the family of Abd Abbas at Sarut, and uh, Salam in January managed to get a phone call through to uh, Abd Abbas at Sarut in Islamic State held territory in eastern Syria. And he asked him, Abd Abbas, what on earth would, in, would lead you to join this awful, horrible, repressive Islamic State? They're terrible. And uh, Salam told me Abd Abbas would have none of it. He completely rejected the criticism and said, for two years, people were starved to death in homes. Civilians were starved, not just fighters, civilians. And the world did not lift a finger. And I asked Salem specifically, did he say that expression? And he said, yes, he did. Did not lift a finger. He said, how dare you? This is Abd Abbas Sayyid to the Syrian activist. How dare you try to teach me about democracy and human rights when nobody helped us uh, despite the brutality we were subjected to. So my point in telling you that story is that while it's as a temporary stopgap measure, American bombing of Islamic State uh, positions in places like Kobani in northern Syria may be helpful in a very tactical kind of way. It doesn't really fix the long-term recruitment problem. There will always be a lot of Abd Abbasid Seruts to join the Islamic State. We can bomb and kill a hundred. They will promptly replace that hundred with more people driven to the Islamic State because of the brutality of the ongoing Syrian civil war and particularly the brutality of the Assad regime. So that's why getting to a new government, a new government through a transition period and a negotiation, what John Kerry was talking about, is really the only way durably to contain and roll back the Islamic State problem in Syria. Um, now, where does the Syrian opposition fit into that? Um, just a couple of things I would say. Number one, um, their position is, is weaker now than it was a year ago. They've actually had not a bad last six weeks, seven weeks. Mohammed may tell us more about that. The immediate risk of encirclement in Aleppo, for example, has receded. They have won back territory um, against regime efforts up around Aleppo just in the last six weeks. Um, at the same time, they have not gained so much as to be able to press the Syrian government, press the Syrian government to go to the negotiating table. Uh, and there is no sign right now that Bashar al-Assad wants to negotiate a new government. Uh, no sign at all. That said, and this is important, that said there are signs that his support base is getting tired 
um, there have been a lot of complaints within communities that have supported the Assad government, Alawis, Christians, Sunni businessmen, and others. There have been more signs of dissent. There have been demonstrations against Assad, even in Kardaha, his hometown. We did not have that a year ago. Um, one of the key inside people in the regime, a guy named Rostom Ghazali, was just fired from his position because of unhappiness with the situation in Kardaha. I mean, Assad's unhappiness with the situation in Kardaha. There have been complaints among communities that have lost tens of thousands of people. I mean, the regime has lost a lot of soldiers. There have been complaints in communities about the high casualties and the lack of accountability in the regime. What I mean by that is not that the Assad regime is going to tumble. It's not. But there are more signs that there are more people in the regime looking for a deal. And so what we need to do is think about how to move that prospect forward. How do we get to a, a negotiation, get to the table? I think there are a variety of things we need to do, but the most important is to keep the pressure on the regime and its supporters so that they finally see they must negotiate. That said, that said, the opposition must, must, must present ideas and a readiness to negotiate with the government and show the supporters of the regime, especially the ones who are tiring, that there is a third option, that the future is not only either Islamic State or Al-Qaeda-backed Nusra extremists or Assad. That is a false choice. The opposition needs to show that there is a third possibility via negotiations and mutual compromises. And that we will need to get the opposition to push forward. That is not entirely easy. There are a lot of people in the opposition who want no negotiations while Assad is in power. And I think that precondition is not sustainable. But if we can get the opposition to accept the idea that there is a negotiation even with the Syrian government, then I think we need on our part to provide more assistance and I mean material assistance, to the opposition to keep the pressure on, not to topple the regime. I want to emphasize that. This is not about toppling the Assad regime. This is about compelling a nasty regime to go to the table. And even if Assad won't go to the table, there may be people around him who say, we have to go to the table. And that's how we have to play it. Paul, I'm going to stop there. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'll be delighted to continue the discussion as we go forward. Thank you, Ambassador Ford. Thank you very much. And thank you for sticking to the timetable, which is often rare. Uh, I Muhammad, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul, and thanks uh, uh, to the Middle East Institute for inviting me. Thanks to all members of the audience for turning out for this um, for this important panel. As you all know, yesterday marked the fourth anniversary of the Syrian Revolution. Uh, four years ago, uh, protesters, peaceful protesters, marched through the Hamidiyya, historic Hamidiyya district of Damascus, market of Damascus, um, and that was about one mile north of the neighborhood where I originally come from, Midan. Uh, the regime responded uh, with uh, with violence, but that only spurred the protests on. In October 2011, just under eight months after the revolution began, protesters turned uh, out in huge numbers, calling for a no-fly zone. In July 2012, the FSA and its local councils controlled the majority of Syria's populated areas and were advancing in the capital itself. They also controlled the same neighborhood <laughs> where I originally came from, Midan. Uh, at the time, President Obama said that he didn't uh, aid um, moderate troubles uh, because there were two, uh, sorry, right now President Obama, recently President Obama said that he didn't aid, aid Syrian rebels sooner because uh, he, he thought they were too weak. As he put it, it was a fantasy uh, to imagine them taking Damascus. But at the time, uh, uh, President Obama's main argument was very different, uh, that they were actually too strong, uh, that Assad's fall, quote unquote, Assad's fall, Assad's fall was inevitable, uh, so why, why get America involved uh, anyways? Uh, so we believe, we in the Syrian opposition believe that had President Obama 
uh, heeded protesters' calls for a no-fly zone, uh, that Assad's fall very well could uh, have been inevitable. From July 2000, uh, from July uh, 15 to 17, 2012, the FSA captured multiple neighborhoods in Damascus and was advancing toward the presidential palace. But on July 17th, and for the first time, Assad deployed uh, helicopter gunships, attack helicopters over Damascus in an unprecedented escalation, and rebels um, uh, captured no new neighborhoods in Damascus after that point. Regime forces were able to regain uh, their, f their footing soon after. In other words, the use of air power in Damascus was a turning point that may have kept, uh, may have kept Assad in power. So we believe that had President Obama heeded the protesters' call for a no-fly zone, uh, we also believe that had the president heeded those calls, that ISIS uh, might be extinct today. In January of 2014, mainstream rebels uh, launched a major offensive against ISIS in north, uh, in north and northwestern uh, Syria. They routed them from those areas, and they actually besieged ISIS in its international headquarters, international uh, capital of Raqqa. It was their main headquarters at the time before they captured Mosul. Uh, Assad responded, and this was documented by Human Rights Watch, Assad responded with his fiercest air raids uh, of the entire war on civilian areas that had just evicted uh, ISIS. This allowed ISIS, of course, uh, to recover, push east, they eventually captured Mosul. And according to IHS Jains, uh, the reputed uh, research center, only 6% of Assad's so-called counter-terror operations target ISIS, while most target moderate, while most of his attacks tar target moderate rebels. And by the way, the, the same center also said that only 13% of, us, of ISIS attacks targeted the Assad regime, uh, the rest of their attacks targeted the, uh, the moderate opposition. Now, we, things have changed a bit. We now have the training equip program for moderate elements of the Syrian opposition. But we're also concerned that this program might founder on the president's resistance to a no-fly zone. Uh, based on Assad's track record, we can bet that the US trainees, recruits, like other moderate rebels, will be, will be uh, lobbed uh, and barraged by barrel bombs after they enter Syria. Uh, perhaps for this reason, uh, anti-ISIS envoy John Allen, we think, um, supports the uh, Turkish proposal for an air exclusion zone, which is more geographically limited. I mean, in the past, the no-fly zone that was proposed in 2012 was much more ambitious. The proposal that we uh, are looking at now is much more geographically limited. It's mainly meant to put a shield over Aleppo, stem the flow of refugees, uh, provide the moderate opposition with uh, space uh, uh, to organize. Uh, General Allen, for his part, also uh, spoke recently and said that the number of eligible recruits for the training equip program has exceeded expectations. This actually shows that despite the doom saying of many pundits in Washington, D.C., um, that the initial spirit of the Syrian revolution against Assad and extremism and sectarianism uh, remain strong. It underscores that the, the, that the training equipped plans are uh, also too modest. We're talking about 5,000 fighters over a number of years. That's only a drop in the bucket. Uh, the program should be enlarged. It should be, it should be accelerated. Uh, we believe that America's failure to support the moderate rebels in 2012 uh, has had disastrous consequences. Uh, in December 2012, um, this is something that Ambassador Ford could also speak to, uh, the Supreme Military uh, Council was formed as a moderate unified command structure with uh, decent legitimacy on the ground. Uh, but the SMC withered on the vine due to the lack of, of real US support. In the summer of 2013, as thousands of Hezbollah fighters invaded Syria through Qusayr, uh, the opposition, the Syrian opposition, was pressured to uh, negotiate in Geneva uh, with Assad instead of providing, instead of being provided with uh, with arms to resist the assault. Uh, around that time, the infamous uh, chemical weapons red line went from uh, transporting weapons to using uh, weapons to large massacres, and then uh, it disappeared. The U.S.-Russian chemical weapons deal was, was uh, close to the death blow uh, for the SMC, and actually the SMC fell apart right after the, uh, right after the uh, President Obama foresaw the strikes. Uh, large coalitions of mainly is Islamist groups formed, and the, SMS, uh, the SMC was, was undermined. So the current like a daysicle strategy 
we think is the is is the worst of both worlds. It puts a target on the back of FSA groups uh, as partners against extremism. That there, there will be a target for Nusra for ISIS, but does not give them the tools uh, to fight back when extremists with uh, when extremists with uh, Assad, Iran, <coughs> ISIS, and Nusra attack. Uh, the FSA affili uh, affiliate Harakat Hazm actually had its uh, support cut in the months before its demise. Um, the remaining FSA brigades should be supported urgently, uh, both with arms and uh, by the way of an air exclusion zone to ensure that they do not may meet Hazm's fate. Uh, some would say, um, isn't it too late? Uh, it might be too late. The FSA is already gone. Uh, we need to start from scratch. There's no moderate rebels left. What are you talking about? Uh, it's, it's all gone. In fact, the, uh, the FSA affiliated Southern Front is the largest and strongest FSA coalition in Syria. They are doing really well. They're making steady advances on the Assad regime day in, day out. They control more of the province of Daraa in southern Syria than the Assad regime does. They control areas near uh, key Israeli and Jordanian population centers. And not only are they fighting the Assad regime, they're also fi fighting Qasem Soleimani, the IGRC. He's, his, uh, he recently has been spotted a number of times uh, there. And they're also fighting uh, Hezbollah. But uh, recently, uh, in, in a conversation with their main coordinator, who visited Washington, D.C., we realized that they only receive about 20% of the support they need. Uh, their fighters get paid about 86 or $85 uh, per fighter per month, whereas Nusra uh, pays at least 300 uh, ISIS in some areas pays up to 500 and if you have a special skill set, you might get paid up to 1000 like if you're a sniper or have some... Uh, some, some sort of a, a special skill set. Um, I want to close by touching on UN envoy uh, de Mistura's plan, which is uh, related to this point. While pushes for peace uh, are always laudable, they're always welcome, and uh, we, all, we, we support all measures to reduce violence in Syria, uh, stop the bloodshed and stop the killing, and protect civilians. We do not think that Mr. de Mistura's plan of uh, the local freezes uh, is based on the Geneva communique of 2012 for a political transition. Uh, the Geneva communique of 2012 call, calls for a uh, Syria-wide transition to a pluralistic democracy. Uh, but unlike his predecessors, Mr. Ibrahim and Mr. Kofi Annan, Mr. Dimistura right now is not talking about political transition. He's talking about freezes in a few neighborhoods in Aleppo. Um, so as a consequence, a freeze in Aleppo could help Assad. Uh, to attack the southern front, um, or a freeze in the south could help Assad to besiege the, 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 the city of Aleppo. And Assad regime has been trying to enact a full siege around Aleppo for, at least since early 2014. This is why the Geneva communique is still the way to go. Uh, it is the most widely accepted multilateral document for a Syria political transition, and it is also the international document that best reflects Syria's aspirations for a pluralistic democracy. This was the initial goal of the Syrian revolution four years ago, and ultimately the Syrian people will accept nothing less. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mohammed. A really excellent and stirring and very informative presentation. Uh, Daphna? Sure. Floor is yours. Someone's watch. Sit down. Just trying to time myself. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul and fellow yeah. panelists. Thank you to the Middle East Institute. I'm so happy that there's so many people here who are honoring the bravery of the Syrian people by coming here to talk about what comes next four years into this horrific tragedy. There's nothing left than horror to describe what has happened since March 15, 2011. Um, I'm going to do something maybe a little controversial, which is to assert an opinion, assert a, a contentious claim, and try to back it up. Uh, it is an optimistic claim but I am the former director for democracy at the National Security Council, so people have come to expect nothing less than potential optimism from me. Um, and then I hope that you can push back against this claim in our question and answers, and I know my panelists will probably poke holes at it as well. So my claim is coming from uh, questions that I've been asked by all kinds of people, including members of Congress, including people in uh, Europe, where Paul and I just met with some Russians who are working on the Moscow Initiative. And the question is this, if the US administration under President Obama is focusing so much and so singularly on countering ISIL. Have they forgotten the Syrian cause, the Syrian revolution, and the 
you know, on the books U.S. foreign policy of transitioning to a post-Assad future? This is a question that's being asked, and I think it's quite legitimately. And I'm going to argue that no, in fact, quite the opposite. Um, in fact, having a organizing principle to counter ISIS right now and having a coalition is offering a chance, if used correctly, if leveraged correctly, to advance the cause of seeing Assad go, bring on a transitional agreement, getting back to negotiations, um, and eventually creating a Syria that lives up to the aspirational ideals that Mohammed has outlined. That is my contentious claim, and I know there's all kinds of counter arguments. So why do I say this, and why am I making this claim to you, a group that clearly cares about the policy of uh, liberation and freedom in Syria? For a number of specific factual reasons first, and I'll start. The battle map. If you look at the current battle map of which fighters control which parts of Syria, and I'm talking in particular of northern Syria, where you have fingers of different groups overlapping non-contiguously, the only way that there will be a governable contiguous space is if ISIS and the extremists are pulled back. They're pulled eastward, and they are diminished back to the Raqqa um, area, Deir al-Azur. Um, so the actual offensive from the sky in particular to limit their capabilities is positive in that regard. Uh, so that would be point number one. The battle map demands that ISIS be pulled back, especially from the Turkish border, if you want to create a governable space in northern uh, Syria. And I agree very much that the southern example is a good counterexample, because here you have territorial cont contiguity in Dara province, um, and that has enabled the southern front to assume command and control and to integrate civilian and military capacity. Point number two is U.S. public opinion. U.S. public opinion has been, it should not be the driving force in U.S. foreign policy towards Syria, but it's interesting to watch over time. In February, mid-February, the Pew uh, polling, which has done extensive polling since 2011, showed that the U.S. public is now significantly more supportive of U.S. military force, sort of U the deployment of U.S. military force to combat ISIS more than it was in September and October when the president first announced the campaign to begin airstrikes in both Iraq and Syria. Now, this is not surprising in the annals of foreign policy. When a leader makes a decision, the public typically comes along in terms of public opinion. But, you know, the public was, it has grown in around 10 percentage points in terms of support for the use of, U when asked, do you believe the U.S. should use military force to counter ISIS? This has grown since October. And I think this is a function of the perception that this is relatively cheap compared to U.S. Uh, previous U.S. interventions in the region. It is being done from the sky. It is being done at the so far low cost to U.S. soldiers and U.S. Air Force, um, and that there has been relatively little of the backlash that was seen against America and Americans in Iraq in 2004, 2005, 2006, when, of course, the insurgency took on a life of its own against the American force. But it's interesting to compare this trend because it shows that the U.S. is not opposed to interventionism in this conflict, per se, and wants to be led somehow, wants to be told what is the threat. You compare these numbers to the only 30-something percentage of Americans who were supportive of the use of U.S. military force in September 2013, at the time that the president made the announcement that was confused, of course, about the intention to go into Syria after the revelations of the massacre and the use of chemical weapons by Assad. So that's point number two. Point number three is the lessons from previous conflicts, I think, suggest the delusion of, it has been said by scholars, the delusion of impartial and limited intervention, right? So previ previous civil wars and previous uh, civil conflicts have shown, whether it's in Africa or Bosnia or even recently in Iraq, that when international powers intervene, they have to do so decisively and they have to pick a side. And what we're see seeing right now is that the U.S. government has, in words, um, but more importantly, indeed, in the past six months, picked a side. It has, of course, always been supporting the Syrian military rebels, the opposition, the, the FSA, although it no, real, no longer really exists. So it has picked a side in that sense. But now its intent in Syria as part of this countering ISIS coalition effort, the strategy is to roll back ISIS and to supplant ISIS with a trained and equipped and improved and more capable uh, non-Assad, non-jihadist force. So it is definitively picking a side. And so then the question I'll leave to the rest of the panel to talk about how you ensure that this force is decisive and capable. This is beyond my expertise, but it's a military question. But this bodes well for the question of the leadership of 
the West, including the United States and the Obama administration, making a claim about who they want to lead the future of Syria. Um, a, a fourth point that I would add here in making this argument is that the architecture itself of this coalition, the fact that 72 nations, maybe really like 20 active ones, are committing to do things. They are following in line. If we look back, and I don't want to look back because, again, I'm an optimist, but on some of the massive mistakes of international policy and failing to respond in time to Syria, one of the key mistakes, I think, was not, nece was not necessarily the 2012 decision making, but also the willingness to let a thousand flowers bloom with our allies, to let the, the US willing and, and thinking that the Saudis and Qataris and Turks, because they supported the same objective of ousting Assad, their means to get there would, would row in the same direction. That was a fatal, fatal logical error of 2012 and 2013. And so the silver lining right now of the coalition against ISIL is that there's an organizing architecture, whether it's under John Allen, whether it's through these local Local small groups, they're calling them now, <laughs> which is reminiscent of what you say in the US government, to focus on individual topics. Um, and I see this architecture as important to leverage to get back to, the, to a negotiated process that the ambassador has talked about, Mohammed has talked about, um, because it, will, it is essential that Syria's neighbors are all picking the same winners and intervening decisively and partially, not impartially, for the same good guys. And that has not happened. So I, have, I am optimistic that this coalition will provide the framework for that. Um, and finally, getting back to the negotiations, <coughs> of course, at the end of the day, building up the opposition and building up the military capacity and defeating ISIS is one part of the equation. The second critical part is changing the calculations of the Assad regime. And it is clear, looking back on the past four years, that Iran and Moscow are the two most important uh, patrons of this regime. So in as much as the US can focus on building up the opposition and training with good governance, with a political track that complements the military training going on in this in Saudi Arabia and Qatar and in Jordan, um, and as much as that is all very necessary, it is also necessary to change the cost-benefit calculations in Damascus. And there, Moscow is potentially changing its mind a little bit. Paul and I have had recent experiences with this. Um, but it is critical that Moscow figure out what are its levers uh, with the regime and then employs them and deploys them. So there's the Moscow talks are maybe a beginning sign of Russia's dissatisfaction with its client, but certainly not sufficient at all as a suggestion of, um, of Russian foreign policy shift towards pushing Assad and towards recognizing that Assad's going to have and his people are going to have to compromise. Um, so anyway, I have more to say about this, but hopefully I've made some somewhat of a convincing case that this is not bad news for the cause of freedom in Syria, that the US administration and the US military is so focused uh, on ISIS and ISIL and these bad guys. And in fact, that these uh, foreign policy goals are complementary and mutually reinforcing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Daphna. A very powerful and optimistic view. Thanks for that. Michael, can you share with us your views? Great job. We'll see. Just would like to thank Middle East Institute for organizing this event and uh, for inviting me here to share my thoughts on this. Um, I'm going to be talking about the military dimension um, of uh, U.S. policy towards Syria, but I think it's important to understand that at least the way that I think about it is that um, if, if you're talking about the train and equip effort, um, we're in the business of supporting basically an insurgency, uh, or at least in the long run uh, we are, and insurgency is an inherently political form of warfare. And in order to succeed in this effort, your military efforts have to be aligned with the political efforts. And that's, I think, one area where I'm going to go into a number of political factors in a moment where I think there's a, a contradiction in our policy. Um, and I think part of the problem is that the uh, mob administration has been um, hindered by, I think, muddled thinking on exactly how to use the military instrument um, and what are realistic policy objectives um, in Syria. First of all, the president's mantra about there being no military solution. Um, I think, first of all, the regime in Damascus doesn't agree with that. I think they believe that there is a military solution, and they believe that they are on track to achieving it, maybe not this year, maybe not next year, but in the long run, if they keep on the current trajectory. So there's an inherent problem if you're dealing with an adversary who you know, thinks that the military, there is a military solution and you don't, um, I, I think there's, that's, that's one fundamental problem we have to come to grips with. Um, secondly, 
There may not be a, military, a purely military solution, but military action is almost certainly key to whatever uh, we may hope to accomplish in Syria in terms of the type of uh, diplomatic solution that Ambassador Ford was talking about in terms of bringing, kind of ripening these contradictions and, and, and tensions within the regime. There is no substitute, I think, for, for, for getting there without um, using the military instrument. The problem we face is that the second you start talking about using the military instrument to put pressure on the regime to get out Assad long run out um, and to create a transition, you bump into our Iran policy. And that's really the elephant in the room here. Um, I think the administration has not done more militarily in Syria since, say, 2012 or 2013, once the Iranians got involved big there, for fear that doing so would scuttle the possibility of a nuclear deal with Iran. And my feeling is that, um, to use a, fra a phrase that was used in, uh, in, in talking about another Arab, uh, another Middle Eastern uh, negotiation, we should negotiate with the Iranians on the nuclear program as if they weren't doing a whole bunch of things that we find very problematic, and we should be pushing back against the things that we find problematic as if we're not engaged in nuclear negotiations. But in fact, I think our Syria ho policy has been hostage to our Iran policy, and unless we can, unless we can resolve that contradiction, and I, I think it's fully resolvable because I don't think the Iranians have been constrained in their policies um, in a lot, in many areas, in areas that I think undermine our interests. So we should not be either. We should negotiate on the nuclear, for a nuclear deal, but we should also then be pushing back and, and doing things in other areas um, that if it's in our interest to do so. Um, I think we also have to recognize that um, we're, we are a large part of the problem in Syria, and our policies have contributed to the rise of ISIS and jihadist groups there. The American inaction, which um, contributed to the to more than 100,000 killed, has been a recruiting bonanza for ISIS and uh, Jabhat al-Nusra and groups like it. The perception that we are tacitly aligned with Iran has further reinforced this problem, um, as is the fact that our first military strikes in Iraq were to save Yazidis at Sinjar, Turkmen at Amrli, Kurds at Erbil, but what have we done for the Sunnis? So ISIS and groups like it are able to say, we are, we are the ones defending the, the Sunni, Sunnis, and you know the Americans talk a good talk, but when you look at their actions, everything is they're they're engaged. Um, they're providing political cover for Assad to do what he wants. They're um, aligned with Assad's allies to strike a grand deal. Whether or not that's true, I think that's the, the way it's played out, or at least that's the way it's perceived in large parts of the reason. And then we had you know Secretary of State Kerry's comment yesterday about the need to negotiate with Assad. Just as we're trying to recruit people, okay, we're, we're saying we're trying to recruit them to fight ISIS, but I think a lot of them have deep down a hope that we, that will eventually change. And these kind of comments, I think, put you know cold water on those kind of hopes. And I don't know if it'll affect our recruiting effort, but again, this is another area where I think our politics run at cross purposes to our military policy. Now, in terms of the whole issue of whether it's too late or not, uh, I think it's important to take a long view. Um, first of all, uh, unfortunately, the fight in Syria is far from over. Um, basically, on the field, although there are in certain theaters, and let's say we're talking about a fragmented battlefield, there is no common logic guiding operations throughout Syria. But by and large, um, you're, you're talking about a stalemate in which there is incremental you know, gains and losses by each side in different places at different times. But I think it's likely that this uh, problem will be with us for a very long time, especially given the fact, like I said before, the Assad regime thinks there is a military solution to this problem. And I think it's um, important to point out that in light of the fact that it will likely be around for a long time, we have to plan for a long-term effort and not say it's a lost cause. We've seen many reversals of fortune several times since 2011. Egypt started as a liberal revolution hijacked by Islamists in the military coup, and in, in Syria, uh, Syria it looked like Assad was a dead man walking, and then all of a sudden there was a reversal of fortune as, thanks to uh, intervention by uh, Iran and Hezbollah. Um, and we've seen likewise in Libya similar reversals of fortune. So we can't rule out the possibility that 
if we do the right things, we will be prepared to take advantage of reversals of fortune of that sort in Syria as well. So that brings us to the train and equip effort. Basically, we're, an invo we're involved in an effort to train 5,000 um, uh, opposition soldiers a year for three years in bases or facilities in Turkey, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, which I think th those are not ready yet. Those will be ready in 60 to 90 days, and Qatar in six to nine months, supposedly. The first elements could be ready for combat toward later this year. I think um, it's important to, to keep in mind the numbers, I think, are less important than the, the psychological dynamic that is created by this effort. And that's, I think, more important is creating an image that momentum is shifting, that America is now committed to a third path um, in a way that we weren't in the past. And it's going to be hard, given the perception that we've abandoned um, our allies in the past in Syria, to make this case. But I think it's vitally important if we we're to succeed to change the psychological dynamic that we're in seriously in this effort. We, are, we will give our allies who we are training and equipping the wherewithal to effectively hold terrain. And let me just say, in this fight, governance is as important as combat capability. And therefore, the ability for our allies that we're training now to hold terrain and create areas where people, um, you know, without our kind of, uh, you know, safe havens for refugees and, and the residents of those areas is vitally important. So governance capability, I think, is important as combat capability in what we're trying to do. And if you create um, a sense of momentum that um, our, the people that we're supporting are, are moving forward, we can hope to at least win back some of the people who used to belong to the Free Syrian Army and went to Jabhat al-Nusra and the Islamic Front and other groups like that. Now, people will say, well, why would we want to take back people like this? Well, you know, this is what we did in Iraq with the, with the Sahwa. Not everybody was members of the national resistance uh, there. There were Al-Qaeda people who were part of Sahwa too. So on an individual basis, I think, you know, if they're vetted properly, we, you know, we can take them back. You know, in terms of Jabhat al-Nusra being rebranded, I think that's more problematic. Um, and this effort could be scalable. If, it's, if it starts, you know, gaining traction, we could build it up. Um, my final points is, uh, and I'm just going to make two last points. I know I'm running on here. Um, this is where you have to actually be a little Machiavellian, too, in terms of our calculation with regard to Iraq and Syria. In Iraq, a rapid victory by the Shiite militias and the Iranian sponsors is not in our interest. It's not in our interest in Iraq. It's not in our interest in Syria. And therefore, um, we, we are trying to propose a model to the Syri uh, Iraqi government of um, well-trained professional military forces that can take back territory and then combine with a political deal, um, incorporate Sunnis into the government, something we've been trying, uh, Ambassador Ford, I know, was working on when he was in, um, in Iraq and when I served there. Um, I don't have um, optimistic hopes that this will succeed, but I think it's the only basis for any kind of sustainable um, uh, political um, uh, arrangement uh, in Iraq. The, the, the model that Iran and the Shiite militias are pushing might, uh, and again, they're running to trouble in, in Tikrit, uh, a small city which is a fraction of the size of, of Erbil. Um, but if they were to succeed in Iraq, first of all, I think long-term Iraq will be broken because there will be, it'll create conditions that will then simply feed a, a revival of ISIS in the long run. And then the militias that succeeded in Iraq will then come to Syria and then we're really in trouble. And our friends that we're trying to train our trouble are, will be in trouble and they'll be able to change the balance there. So my final comment is we can't succeed in Iraq long-term unless we succeed in Syria. Um, and even if we push ISIS underground into the periphery in Iraq, if, if it's done the wrong way, they'll be back in Iraq, and they will draw strength from their safe haven in Syria. So if we want our, our, main, our main effort in Iraq to succeed, and I don't like that term, it's a military term of art, but um, we, should, we need to have a main effort in Syria as well, uh, and they both have to have a similar balance in emphasis in, in our policy. I'll conclude my comments and look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Michael, and all the panelists. It really was an exceptional panel. I'm going to ask a few questions and then turn it over to the audience for their questions. <clears throat> Let me ask with a quick question to Mike, linking it to what Muhammad was talking about in terms of air exclusion or no-fly zone. A lot of people have been asking the question, if these train and equip groups that the U.S. is, and with its allies training and funding, brought into the battlefield in Syria, and if they are attacked by Syrian air power, what is the U.S., you know, what's the thinking there? 
I am not a big fan of ideas of no-fly zones. Um, uh, I was actually, I, I was in operation to provide comfort in northern Iraq in 91. And a lot of people forget that we had a Marine Expeditionary Unit on the ground and Royal Navy Commandos and U.S. Special Forces to keep, to ensure the safe, the, the security of the safe haven on the ground. And so any kind of safe ca haven needs uh, capable forces on the ground. I would argue that to protect the um, Iraqis against the uh, Syrian Air Force, we need to put a heavy emphasis on air defense training. Um, now, and this gets into the whole debate about manned portable air defense uh, systems. Um, I would, I would be, you know, I think there are ways we could probably manage the problem of getting in small numbers of man pads to um, that we can we can manage it with people who are properly vetted that um, we could they could shoot down enough Syrian aircraft that they force them to fly at higher altitudes and reduce the intensity of operations, and then you have a heavy uh, use of uh, air defense artillery. You know, we forget before the, inv uh, the in invention of the SAM, it was it was AAA that was uh, caused. Uh, you know, the, the the majority of losses I think of the Eighth Air Force in World War II and over Germany like and and. Um, you know, give people, you know, train them very well in air defense artillery. Um, that will deal with the problem with, uh, or, or the concerns about man pads. And it'll force uh, probably the Syrian Air Force to operate at altitudes and in ways that dr dramatically reduces their effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So I just am concerned. First of all, I think politically, given this administration where it's at, they'll never sign on to it anyhow. Mm -hmm. So we need to find a way to work around their concerns. And I think this, this may be, I don't know, this might be, a way of doing it. Thanks, Mike. So. Very helpful. Uh, let me, if I may, to Daphna, and then um, I'll just shoot questions. I mean, on, you're an optimist, Daphna, and that's that's good. And I wanted to ask you a bit about the U.S.-Iran, you know, aspect of this, but mainly, as you say, looking forward. And I'm, you know, I look at the U.S.-Iranian situation as it reflects on Syria, and I look forward. And I, my fear, and that's why I want to, you know, what's the what's the positive? What's the optimistic? My v fear is if there is a kind of a deal. Iran will feel empowered. Uh, Iran will have more, you know, eventually lifting of sanctions, more money. They will feel triumphant. The Sunni opposition will feel, as I think Hamad and others felt, well, you know, it makes it worse because it looks like the U.S. is close to the Assad regime. Now, there's my fear is if there is a deal, Iran will double down in Syria and feel that they're winning and, and make a deal more difficult. And if, the, you know, on the other hand, if the negotiations break down, they will hunker down and will be in no mood for compromise. I'm worried, I mean, things are bad already. And as we, you know, the Russians maybe are, are, are nervous, but I haven't felt yet that the Iranians, who really control the regime to a large degree, uh, are really at a, you know, in a position to make a deal or wanting to push for a deal. I'm worried that it might get worse. What is, what is an optimistic view of that? Uh, uh, turning to you sure. for that. No, I'm happy to play You're that. the optimist. Sure, I'm happy right. to play that role. First, I would just say that I have been looking, since I left government a year ago, for any evidence of this grand bargain that people are alluding to, that the U.S. has stayed out of Syria because of its negotiations. Negotiations, and I see no evidence, really. I mean, I'm coming at this really objectively. I see no evidence, mostly because, you know, both sides in the Iranian nuclear negotiations are clearly focused on this file of the nuclear file. Um, and they are, in some ways, especially on the Iranian side, only been given the latitude to negotiate on the nuclear deal. Because you see during this time period, since the JPOA, the joint plan that was announced in November 2013, Zarif and Rouhani are focused on this negotiation while their peers in the government are coming into Baghdad, going into Damascus, making military decisions. There seems to be two different sets of uh, operating you know, frameworks in terms of foreign policy. Um, the only optimistic, so I say there's maybe, it's like a two by two in terms of what happens, deal, no deal, uh, moderates uh, and, and and conservatives empowered in both scenarios in Tehran. But that's those are the variables, right? We're looking at both situations in both cases. Um, the economy is something you left out, and I think the economy bodes well. I mean, it's bad for people in Iran, but it is maybe potentially optimistic as a break on some of the uh, the adventurism that Tehran has been engaged in, both in Damascus and in Syria, expending enormous amount of resources economically and financially in fighting this battle and in supporting Assad, as well as in in Iraq. So at some point, this is just not going to be sustain sustainable. You know, even in an autocracy that doesn't have to respond to its people, Iran has real needs and the economy is going down every month and the price of oil is really hurting uh, the economy. So at some point, there's going to be a break and a reckoning in either the deal or no deal situation. Um, so, and I think that is the, the argument for optimism. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Uh, thanks, Muhammad. You have a response to that, and I also have a question to you. But go ahead with your response. Yes. Uh, actually, we do have evidence to the contrary. Uh, we know for a fact, we're positive, 100% sure, that some of the reluctance uh, to do more, especially in northern Syria, uh, against the Assad regime. In, way, in the following ways, for example, you know, uh, U.S. planes are crisscrossing Syria skies. So we did suggest to some officials that, you know, since you're already bombing ISIS in Syria, you could bomb them in areas, uh, like in some towns in Aleppo, in Membej, in Bab, they uh, maintain presence there, and the opposition there is fighting a three-front war, Nusra, ISIS, and the Assad regime. So you could alleviate some of that pressure off of the opposition and potentially help the opposition uh, uh, sort of like concentrate their efforts on, on the Assad regime. Um, I can't comment on like the conversations, but I can tell you that the U.S. administration did not want to do that because they were concerned that uh, the Iranians would use their uh, militias in Iraq uh, to turn up the heat against them in Iraq. Uh, and this belief uh, was also shared by some generals in, in the Pentagon. So we, do, we think it's actually wrong for U.S. foreign policy in general to be held hostage to Iran. And we specifically and particularly believe that it's uh, also immoral to hold uh, protect, uh, protection of civilians in Syria hostage to any geopolitical, uh, you know, uh, deals with Iran. So uh, I think that maybe, Ambassador Ford, maybe you can speak to that too. Mohammed, I have a, let me ask you though, but thank you for that. Uh, I mean, it's four years now into this conflict. I understand President Assad doesn't want to leave and no presidents want to leave. ISIS doesn't want to negotiate. But you're involved in, a, you know, the Syria Roadmap Project. And as Syrians who've been, you know, at war for four years, uh, is there no sort of process other than Geneva and Moscow where Syrians are talking to each other, trying to figure out a common future? At the end of the day, as Ambassador Ford said, people who support or, you know, willy-nilly now have to support Assad because they're afraid of it. They're exhausted. They want a way out. Many the opposition want to negotiate, want a way out. And it's been four years. Uh, is, are there outlines of, of uh, you know, a final settlement that have been communicated through back channels other than those provided by Russia or, or the UN or there, Geneva? There's, a, there's actually a number of tracks. Uh, <laughs> So there's actually a number of tracks. The Syrian opposition most recently, uh, there was an expanded meeting, the National Coalition of Opposition Revolutionary Forces, that's the opposition's main uh, political body, uh, as well as other gr smaller groups, uh, the uh, coordination. Yes, the national coordination body, they met in uh, Paris and they uh, did hammer out sort of like a, cam a common uh, uh, platform for a plan for a transition, should a transition be set in motion in Syria. So I think there is consensus among the Syrian opposition. This was uh, some. This is something the Obama administration is aware of. There was a comment uh, from, I think, Department of State praising uh, that recent the, the recent meeting in Paris, and we think it's a step in the in the right direction. So I don't. I think there's a plethora of plans. There's multiple plans. Problem is the key question is how do you set these plans in motion? Mm -hmm. um, so that's track number one. There are also uh, track two. Uh, some also attract to diplomacy by some independent members of the opposition who also have plans for uh, they're, they're willing to negotiate with uh, with the regime and as you know the Syrian opposition demonstrated its commitment to negotiations with the regime in Geneva uh, the regime would not even discuss any substantive issue and they kept grandstanding about terrorism uh, in in Syria so we're also aware of uh, m multiple track to uh, efforts by very well respected members of the Syrian opposition uh, that also involve uh, that also involve negotiations. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, Ambassador Ford, I have a, I'm, you might have comments obviously on what you've heard, uh, but I want to ask you about the allies. You were recently in Turkey, um, and and uh, you know uh, my question really is, I mean at this point the U.S. has a plan vis-a-vis uh, -vis ISIS, an official coalition. It has an official train and equip program. Turkey, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and others are committed and involved in that particular thing. And yet we hear, you know, from Turkey and elsewhere that they're not fully comfortable. Maybe Turkey and Saudi Arabia are cooking up something, something else. Where are our allies uh, at this point in the region vis-a-vis -vis 
the anti-ISIS effort and the anti, well, the Syria part of that, uh, you know, of that whole effort. I, I want to talk about that, but I first want to tell the um, audience a couple of points on Iran that I think are important. Um, first, it's a matter of record. Uh, this administration strongly supported the retention of Nouri al-Maliki as prime minister of Iraq after elections there in 2010. And guess who else did? Iran. Fast forward four years, Mosul falls in Iraq. Iraqis, not Americans, not Iranians, Iraqis came forward with a proposed alternative to Nouri al-Maliki to save the day on the Iraq side over and uh, facing the Islamic State. The Americans and the Iranians both coalesced behind the prime ministry candidacy of Hyder al-Abadi. So I don't think um, Iran's position on Syria is forever Bashar al-Assad or nothing else. I think like so many people in Syria who have backed the Assad regime because they're terrified, not unreasonably, frankly, uh, they're terrified of the extremist element in the Syrian opposition. I think if the Iranians saw that there were some viable choices, I think they're pretty shrewd negotiators, and I think um, I think they would weigh the positives and the minuses of that. Problem is that that hasn't been put forward in a serious way. Um, a second point on Iran and the relationship to Syria and Iraq. Um, I think it is a terrible fallacy terrible fallacy to think that if the Americans keep pressure low on Bashar al-Assad in Syria, we will earn Iranian goodwill towards our forces on the ground in Iraq. I served in Iraq five years. Um, I can tell you direct first-hand experience, we were regularly shelled by Iranian-backed Shia militia because they wanted American forces out of Iraq. And as soon as the Iranians decide that our airstrikes in Iraq against the Islamic State are no longer useful, I suspect they will start having their Shia militia friends shell our forces in Iraq again. And it really doesn't have a whole lot to do with Syria. There is a long-standing Iranian policy. They don't want American ground forces in Iraq. That's not new. That's old. So now, with respect to other regional players, such as Turkey and Saudi Arabia, Qatar, um, that you mentioned, Paul, there is a there is a coalition um, which they have assembled, and and some countries, not Turkey, uh, but occasionally Qatar and Saudi Arabia are even involved in airstrikes. Um, very noticeable that, for example, the Saudis are involved in airstrikes in Syria, but not in Iraq, and that gets back to the whole issue of the Shia influence in Baghdad. But with respect to our plans to deploy a force into Syria with the help of Saudi Arabia, with the help of Turkey, with the help of Qatar, there is a problem in that we don't all agree who is the enemy that this force we're going to deploy, this Syrian opposition force, who is the enemy that they're supposed to fight? The Americans, if you read the statements out of Washington, say it is to fight only the Islamic State. If you read what, for example, the Turkish foreign minister has said, if you read what uh, officials in Saudi Arabia are backgrounding on the news, or the Qataris are backgrounding on the news, you will hear them saying, fight Islamic State and the Assad regime. So the allies assembling this new Syrian force to go into either northern Syria, eastern Syria, I'm not sure where it's going to go, uh, they themselves don't exactly grant who the enemy is. I personally doubt that this new Syrian force, which is going to start off pretty small, as Mike said, 5,000 roughly, um, it's going to start off small, it's going to be injected into an incredibly hostile terrain. If its foreign patrons themselves don't agree on who the enemy is, it's going to be kind of hard to agree on what the strategy is if you don't agree on who the enemy is, um, I suspect they're going to they're going to have problems from the get go, and so one of the first things to do with this is to get everybody on board. Who is this force supposed to fight, and who is it not supposed to fight? This is especially important uh, 
when, as Mohammed mentioned, the fighting in some parts of Syria is really close quarters. You've got Islamic State over here. Go 15 miles down the road. You've got Assad forces over there. You put a force in the middle of that, and they're only supposed to fight that way, not that way. <laughs> and the Turks are saying, no, fight that way too. Uh, that's going to be really hard on the Syrians that we're trying to deploy. So the first thing is get the ducks lined up among the regional allies. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Uh, the floor is for the audience to raise questions all the way in the back. Keep your hand up so the microphone reaches you. Gentlemen in the back, and introduce yourself, please. Flavius Mihez with the World Bank. Thank you very much for this uh, expose. Um, I have a quick question regarding the Kurdish card in Syria. Some areas of Syria are under um, uh, self-proclaimed autonomy, and uh, the Kurds are seem to be fighting uh, uh, both the Assad regime at some point, although they prompted accusation that they broke an agreement with Assad when the uh, Assad regime uh, withdrew in 2012, and they, of course, as we know, fighting or containing the Islamic State. And the, the, the factor, the Kurdish factor, will obviously affect the calculation of Turkey, and we've seen that obviously in Kobani. So now there are three areas, Kobani being the most well-known that are self-governed by the YPG. We don't necessarily think uh, hi as highly of the hi YPG as the KRG for, for the reason that they associated with PKK, etc. And I wonder, no, no Kurdish uh, question has been raised during that panel conversation. Ambassador Ford and maybe other, where does this leave us to work on that strategy in Syria? Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a few questions. If you could make note of the questions for those who are, want to answer, sir, in the fourth row. I'm Bill Stubner from the International Peace and Security Institute. I've just come back from uh, eight days along the Syrian-Turkish border, primarily talking to uh, families who have brought their children or other members of the family there who are horribly mutilated, trying to get emergency care. And then, of course, they're returning to Syria. Uh, Many of them now are moving into ISIS-controlled area simply for two reasons. Number one, to avoid the barrel bombing. Uh, I talked to one family who had been hit three times already. They keep moving, and it's like they have a black cloud over their head. So they're going to move to ISIS territory where they hate ISIS, but they can be at least safe from the bombing. The other thing is they pay less rent for a leaky tent in ISIS-controlled area because, of course, the UN's not doing anything with uh, IDP camps inside Syria because of danger. And so these are entrepreneurial war profiteer type uh, organizations. Uh, I spent the entire war uh, in Bosnia. And uh, frankly, what we did have there was a no-fly zone. Uh, I didn't agree with the safe havens because the UN was in, in charge, so we were never going to have safety. Uh, but if we had not had a no-fly zone, instead of 10,000 people being killed in Sarajevo, we'd have had at least 100,000 killed, and it would have been nothing but a smoking ruin. Uh, so uh, I, I'd like to ask if we... <laughs> We all, I think we all recognize ISIS really, the recruitment comes because of all of what happens to people who have nowhere else to turn. Uh, what do we do, what do we really do to stymie that? What do we do to enable the FSA, if, if they're willing, to actually turn against ISIS instead of being on this three front war? How, how do we make that happen? Thanks, uh, Tom in the fourth row. Thank you, Paul. Tom Lipman, Middle East Institute. I just finished reading a very depressing book called Savage Continent, which is about what happened in Europe after the German surrender ended World War II. Things got much worse for ordinary people. The absence of central authority, the breakdown of all the traditional sources of authority, the physical damage, the privation, and the pent-up ethnic hostilities made things terrible combined with the worst winter of the 20th century in Europe. And think about Syria now. If you saw that photo in the paper the other day of Syria at night, yeah. as seen from the satellite, there's, there's nothing, what's left? How is it going to be possible once the shooting stops, which it will, to create a viable, unified, politically functioning country in which a government has a monopoly on armaments and violence? I, I don't see how that could be done. Thank you, Tom. Uh, question there, the front. <clears throat> 
Hi, um, I have two questions. Your, your name, please. Um, student, yeah, I'm a student and research assistant at the High International Studies of International Relation from Quebec. And your name is? Um, I have two questions to Mr. Ford. <laughs> uh, first question is, um, how do we make sure that U.S. material support don't go to the wrong ends like it happened in the past? And my second question is, what is the position of Russia and other permanent members uh, within the Security Council concerning the proposal uh, that you just like mentioned of like um, not toppling the uh, Assad regime but uh, pressuring them and how the U.S. plan to bring this proposal to the table? Okay, let's uh, handle that round of questions. Mohammed, can I ask you to go first about the day after, since you've worked on it? Uh, sure. Um, have a hard enough time getting to that day, but what about the day after? You're right. So d definitely it's going to be a challenge, and you're right, we will need uh, to make sure that the state has monopoly over violence. Uh, it's not going to be easy, I'm not going to pretend that it's going to be easy, it's going to be very challenging, and that's why we're saying the sooner you put an end to this, the better. The sooner the shooting stops, the better. And uh, the country right now is turning into a Somalia. We have uh, uh, like a number of, uh, uh, you know, we have lots of militias, and uh, it's not going to be easy at all. But but if you, if you set in motion a managed transition in which members of the opposition and members of the existing government um, form a council or a caretaker uh, body of sorts and um, transition the country, like, you know, try and do their best to ensure um, that the majority, I wouldn't say all, oh, because that would be very almost impossible, the hostilities stop. And then you lay, lay the groundwork for a political process and people um, see that there is, you know, you gain, people have faith in that process, then maybe eventually, uh, like a number of years down the road, you could get there. But it's not going to be easy. And uh, that's number one. Number two, most of the time we talk about hypotheticals, like what could happen in the future, you know, if the regime falls, it's going to be like a nightmare, things like that. And we turn a blind eye and we neglect reality. I have a reality that's staring me in the face right now, and this reality is exactly what you described. No central authority, Assad has been reduced to a mayor or uh, of, of uh, the Malki neighborhood where he lives. Okay, he does not even control all of Damascus. Uh, we have uh, transnational terror groups operating in the country. They control major population centers. And uh, then you have uh, chaos in other areas. So I would like to prepare for the future. I would like to make sure that I have that body one day. I have that negotiations and, and uh, we set that process in motion. But at the same time, I want to deal with this reality that's staring me in the face. Because what I have now is precisely what you described could happen in the future. I don't have to wait until that happens. That actually has already happened and I need to deal with it. And the only way you can deal with it is to put an end to this as soon as possible. Thank you, Mohammed. Robert, <laughs> any of the points you want to touch on? Um, I would like to talk about the Kurds. Um, I think uh, that's a really important topic. Um, and I th this is a direct U.S. policy issue today, right now. So uh, a couple of things to say on that. Number one, um, the Syrian Kurds uh, have been really good fighters against the Islamic State. And I think many of you saw the, the fighting in Kobani where they, they fought back quite hard. Um, they were very dedicated. Of course, they benefited hugely from uh, hundreds of American airstrikes. About 80% of our airstrikes in Syria have been in and around Kobani. Um, but, I mean, they benefited from that and they took advantage. And so we have to salute them for being for being good fighters. But that said, we also need to understand they have an agenda. Of course they have an agenda. I mean, everybody's got an agenda. What's their agenda? Their agenda is not a reunified Syria. Their agenda is an autonomous zone in Syria. They've already declared it, actually. They're setting up their own administration, eventually linked to other parts of Kurdistan in Iraq and, and beyond. Um, some Iraqi Kurds in a place called Sinjar, when they were finally uh, liberated from the Islamic State, their areas, they actually called from Iraq to join this autonomous region in Syria. Do you think the Turks noticed that? 
So we have to be careful with this. That you know, American airstrikes to help very good Kurdish fighters against the Islamic State. We need to be careful with this. That we're not at the same time we're fighting the Islamic State, setting up the seeds for, frankly, a longer-term battle between Arabs and Kurds in northeastern Syria. And this is why it's even trickier. Unlike Iraq, where the Kurdish area is relatively homogenous. There are like Kurds here, and there are Arabs over there. Erbil, Mosul. In Syria, they're much more intermixed. So you have like pockets of Kurds here, and then you've got pockets of Arabs over there, and, got, and they're all, it's, it's just, it looks different when you look at the map of the ethnic distribution in northeastern Syria. Because of that, this Kurdish announcement of an autonomous region has stirred anger among Arab tribes living in those areas. And many of them have joined the Assad regime. The Assad regime has actually mobilized them into new military units. As Assad's mobilizing new forces into military units, is that helping us get to a negotiation to deal with the Syria problem long term? Or does that just increase the confidence of Assad that if he holds out long enough, people will come around to him? This is what I mean about if we go in myopically, just focused on the Islamic State only, and not look at the bigger picture, we can actually create complications for our own longer-term national security interests. So as I think about this, as I think about this, the Kurdish demand for autonomy may be perfectly reasonable at some point. I look across the border at Iraq, and I have to say, the Kurdish regional government in Iraq functions pretty well, certainly is a friend of the United States, and it, for the most part is a successful experiment. And decentralization is probably one of the few ways that Iraq will maintain any national unity. And it may well be that decentralization in Syria <laughs> may be the only way to get to some kind of long-term national unity with <laughs> lots of changes. Uh, but that isn't declared autonomously by a Kurdish fighting group, which, by the way, is affiliated with the terrorist PKK organization. That has to be negotiated among Syrians so that we don't have a longer-term problem. It's negotiated in Iraq. Constitution, 2005, oh my God, those were hard negotiations. So it's going to be hard and tough in Syria, but it can't be done unilaterally. It has to be part of a larger political negotiation about the future of Syria at the right time. I, obviously, right now is not the right time. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Uh, Mike? Yeah, I just, if I could just make two quick, mm -hmm. just two quick. Um, the first one is just on the no-fly zones. Oh, okay. On the no-fly zone. Look, I, I think um, there's in the toolkit there are a lot of potential solutions. The, the challenge that any policy um, analyst has is trying to find something which is within the comfort zone of the given administration at the time. And so I just see, you know, the president as being very strongly committed to not getting the U.S., you know, as he said, he said numerous times, you know, I was elected to get the United States out of Middle Eastern wars, not to get us in again. He had to backtrack. But I, I just see no-fly zone being something which might be I, I bridge too far at this point. So I, I, I am trying to find ways in which we can work within the administration's you know preferences to accomplish the same objective, and which is why I emphasize you know AAA and, and the like. I, I'm putting Syria back together again. There's really there's two models, at least two models. I could. You know, you know, throw out. First, you got uh, you know, kind of uh, transitional justice and national reconciliation processes, and we've seen that you know, um, in various parts of the world where you have um, truth tell. You know, and, and usually there's actually a whole literature on this. You know, you have truth telling and um, um, kind of. Uh, token acts of justice and compensation and redefining relationships from perpetrators and victims to kind of common citizens. The problem is um, you find almost none of this in this part of the world. Uh, all the examples are in Africa or S South America or Asia, um, and which is kind of a curious point because you do have a tri tribal reconciliation processes and the like, at least for, for lower level, that do work very often you know, reasonably well. Um, although we had, when we were in Iraq, Act, there was reports that even that was not working in parts of uh, in Anbar. Some of the crimes of Al Qaeda were considered so egregious that tribes refused reconciliation with other tribes that were involved with Al Qaeda. And um, I'm not quite sure exactly how that, if that ever resolved itself. But 
the other model is beyond national reconciliation is forgetfulness. You know, Lebanon or Algeria, you know, kind of let's just put it behind. And the problem is you have like in Lebanon today, we see once again, you know, everybody for years, people say, no, it could never happen again, not another civil war. But now people are saying, you know, maybe. So that's always the risk when you don't have a process. And let's face it, there's no process is perfect and doesn't provide a guarantee. So um, there are ways that societies have found to deal with these kind of really horrible, you know, legacies. Um, but the problem is, we had. A, I was involved in an organization, in the U.S. military organization that was doing that in Iraq, and there really there was no buy-in, you know, to do national reconciliation. It's tr it's victor's justice, and it's you know either you know zero sum politics, and we have to find a way to get beyond that. But we're in this problem. That's why we're in this problem. <laughs> Really, mm -hmm. you know, definitely. Can I just add one point? Um, I think a lot of us are in, in agreement about this fact that, you know, there are a lot of unresolved political questions about the future of Syria. In my mind, there's three most important ones. This question of minority rights and guarantees in uh, post-Assad Syria, especially at second decentralization, what type of decentralization? It will clearly be unequal parts, right? They will be different and separate, and they will have different <laughs> roles and cultural roles. And then the third is the civilian-military relationship. How will the current civilian infrastructure, LCCs and others, um, interact with a military command that will clearly win or be victorious? And so when I think about this bucket of issues, and, and many more, but those are three that come to mind, um, I actually think that now, maybe the ambassador agrees with me, I'm not sure, but now is the time to actually be talking about these things and not just wait to the day after for two main reasons. One, we want to get the allies on board. The Turks and the Saudis probably disagree with the United States and other allies on all three issues. And it makes sense to hash out the disagreements now. And second, we have the most or most leverage with the military opposition right now at this moment when there's an offer of assistance and training and we're handing money and weapons um, to a beleaguered force that has basically lost and we're trying to resuscitate. So I think the, the vision and the demands in terms of political principles um, should be worked on right now. And it's been a mistake to really just focus on the train and equip militarily without a similar vision for a governance train and equip um, process. I mean, we were involved in some of these efforts with the, the SOC, the SNC, and but that's only part of it. You know, it's really the issue is on the ground. What is effective governance? Are there models? And if you think about the paradigm in terms of training and equipping military force, the, 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 the parallel is, you know, where is examples of good governance? Can we elevate them? Can we train? I mean, the same questions apply to the civilian demands of governance. And finally, I would just say that sometimes these conflict or often these conflicts end with that political resolution imposed from the top and those never work what's really going to be endure is a political resolution that is a top down meets a bottom up um, so any kind of civil military reconciliation and some of the work on these governance issues now will be very important for the endurance of any political resolution that's ar arrived at, at Geneva three or four or five thanks Daphne well, we're almost out of time a couple of quick questions uh, lady the front here Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sina Mohammed. I am the European representative of the Autonomous Region Administration in the Syria, Kurdish Autonomous Region, in the north and northeast of Syria. Uh, just I want to say I have met Mr. Ford many times also in Egypt, if you remember. Yes. That time, really, I want to say, we were all the Syrian people, we wish that we have the Arab Spring, which started in Syria, and now it is the fifth year we hope that we have the Arab Spring in Syria, but till now, unfortunately, only we have winds and winters, which made most of the Syrian people now refugees in all over the world, and many people's hundred thousands of people that were being killed. I want to ask here, what's the project of the opposition in Syria? Mr. Ford, he mentioned that the Kurdish people in the north of Syria, they have a project. Of course we have a project. If I don't have any projects, that time I will destroy my country without any things. What's the project there? Our project there to build a democratic Syria. 
In the future, we want a democratic Syria, multi-nation, pluralist, decentralized Syria, all the minorities there, Arabs, Kurds, Assyrians, Dirzis, all they have the rights in Syria. With uni united Syria, not separated, not independent. This is our project. But what can I ask here? Just I want to ask one question, please. If this is the project, what can you say? How can you support such a project? This is one question. Another one. Thank you. But what can yeah, just what, please, Honey, about the Kurdish uh, fighters who are now fighting on the ground? Only the real fighters who are writing, uh, fighting on the ground in the north of Syria. They are Kurds in Kubani now in Sarikania, in Ras Al Ain in Tal Tamer, who is now attacked by the ISIS against the uh, Syrian people, the Christian people, people there. Now we uh, we ask. How can we help now the Assyrian people, the Kurds people, the Arabs people there in order not to have another Kubani in Tal Tamer, which is the Christians and the Assyrians villages there? Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A final question, anyone? The gentleman, yes, in the fifth row. Uh, thank you. I'm Matt Harbo, the uh, National Council on Yasser's uh, Arab Relations. Uh, uh, just a very, very uh, kind of uh, very general question. Where is the Syrian National Coalition? I mean, institutionally speaking, personally speaking, how are they interacting with each other? Where do they stand on all of this? Thank you. Uh, Hamad, do you want to start? Uh, sure. Um, first of all, I would just like to... Uh, make sure that you know that I do not speak for the National Coalition. I'm not a member of the National Coalition. Uh, I do know about the National Coalition. I have lots of friends in the National Coalition and um, uh, I can answer the question. So uh, they are committed. Uh, they would like to transition Syria to a post-Assad democracy. They have a common vision for what that future Syria will look like. They want a Syria where everyone is respected regardless of their ethnicity, gender, uh, or religious uh, background. They uh, went to Geneva in 2014 and they sat across the table from uh, members of the uh, the Assad regime and Ambassador Ford was, was there. And they uh, engaged in good faith. Um, they do not believe that uh, Assad, the Assad as a figure can reunite Syrians again. Uh, and they're asking for Assad's departure. So uh, there are lots of, uh, they mainly operate in exile, but they also have presence inside Syria because, uh, and this is also to your point about how you put Syria back together. In the summer of 2012, after the Assad regime lost control of about 50% of the country, the state was retracting or uh, contracting. And parts of Aleppo, for example, uh, Syria's pre-war commercial capital, uh, people there had no one to turn to. So local councils emerged, just you know, uh, regular citizens, uh, doctors, engineers, they came together and they started, uh, started those councils. And they started working on providing communities with basic goods and services, running bakeries, hospitals, uh, why not, you name it. So those local councils are also members of the national coalition. So I wouldn't say that the entire coalition mainly operates in, in exile. So there's this dynamic inside and, uh, and outside. And we do have hope that those civilian-run pro-democracy structures, governance structures, uh, that do exist in Syria now and are fighting uh, to make sure that these communities are not radicalized against seemingly insurmountable odds are empowered uh, to play that role. Thank you, Muhammad. Daphna, Mike, or Robert, any final comments? Yes or no? Well, thank you all for coming, and please join me in thanking our panel.